Hi guys, it's Blackie and welcome back to the channel. Okay, today I want to do a little bit of a deep dive in understanding wet weather fires. Okay. Now, if you have followed any kind of bushcraft channel for any length of time, I did it. I know everybody else did, although it's been 10 plus years, I think, since I did it. But it's sort of a thing you got to do if you're doing a bushcraft, woodcraft channel is you've got to do a fire in the rain. And I bet if you do a search, you're gonna find a couple of thousand channels that have done a fire in the rain. And it's good teaching, it's good information. It really is for the most part. But at the same time, I wanna do a little deeper dive. I want you to understand more in depth what's going on about this and a better understanding of the conditions you're facing and what you've got to overcome. The actual act of building the fire is fairly straightforward, but I want you to have a better understanding of the depth of it. So we're gonna do a deep dive, okay? First off, let's start with the fact of it's been raining. Maybe it's rained intensely for the last hour, two hours, whatever or maybe for several days and everything around you is sopping wet okay and you need to build a fire first we're going to do our five w's we're stopping either for a temporary to build us a fire to heat us up something to eat or we're actually stopping for the night and so i'm going to use the five w's to determine my campsite area wood water weather, wind, rain, etc. widow makers, and wildlife, those five. Now under the weather is where I want to touch at right now. <clears throat> Seeing the fact that a broad leaf, when I'm talking about a broad leaf, I mean like a tree with a broad leaf can act like an umbrella. So when I'm looking for some place fairly dry, where am I going to be looking for tinder up under something like that? Because that broad leaf can act like an umbrella, so many of them around the tree. And so it will be drier, not necessarily truly dry, but drier up under, even if it's been raining for several days. And so that's what I'm looking for, for a place to set my camp and a place to build my fire to begin with. Now, let's say I have found up under a tree, broad leaves or something like that, and I have found a semi-dry place, some place where I can find stuff up off the ground in the air column that when I shake it, what, any surface water comes off, and it still snaps when I bend it. That is usable tinder, okay? So I start gathering up that. I will have selected my camp area got it set and then I'm going to probably empty out my haversack completely and go gathering timber tender because it's going to be hard to find a lot in any given space it's going to be a little bit here and a little bit there is those sheltered areas so I'm going to gather a lot I want my haversack stuff full of it where I can't hardly wedge any more in because I only want to build this fire once go through all this effort once I don't want to start it and be kind of, well, you know, you know, Blackie, it's kind of cold and I, you know, I don't really mind it. You're going to end up with no fire or you're going to end up having to build it again. I want to do it once. Okay. <clears throat> once I've got a haversack stuffed with smalls that all snap. Okay. Then I'm going to look for my neck size up tender. And knowing that, this piece right here, it snaps when I, but the outside of it is sopping wet. So knowing that that's the bark is wet, I'm going to have to remove that bark. Now, I'm going to just gather this up wet and bring it back to my fireside and make a pile of this. How big a pile? I want a pile like that of it. Because once I get my fire going, I don't want to have to run and get more. I want to get it going, okay? I have now got my smalls 
I have got my kindling really and I'm gonna bring up my neck size my bigger size hunks and things like that big base pieces and this is broke off of a tree and you see that wet bark we're gonna deal with that in a minute but I want several pieces this size for the base we'll get to the how to build it in just a second but I want to look and find this now if this is something I can bust up cut saw and get the size I need great a standing piece a standing piece that's semi dry standing up would be ideal stone dead something I can cut off and snap off even better but I gotta get rid of that bark because it's going to be a detriment okay now we get to the point of building the fire but the ground let's start with it the ground layer the ground itself we selected it because it was drier than the surrounding that can be better drainage what the soil composition is etc but you know that there's going to be water in it because it's been raining and even though it may have been kind of sheltered right here the ground has become saturated and water has run sideways so there's a water content there so I want to scrape up some of this drier dirt and let's say here is ground level I want to scrape up some of this drier dirt and I want to make a mound right here a mound of that dirt why water always flows downhill correct so by me mounding this dirt up and the water table being down here somewhere any water that's in the dirt I just scraped up is going to want to flow downward by itself and it's going to filter down, drying out even more this top layer right there. Okay, I have now got my mound and I'm going to take those big base logs and I'm going to put them right here. I'm going to put three of them. I'm only going to leave about an inch between them maybe an inch and a half at most like that this gap is necessary for air so that when my ignition occurs I want air to flow up and more important as my coals begin to fall down I want them to fall into that thing and get these logs burning as well okay but remember that water the surface temperature, excuse me, the temperature of the fire is going to be somewhere around 1800 degrees. Water boils at 212 degrees. That means that heat from up here is going to be radiating straight down. So the moisture content in this ground is going to get hot, it's going to start drying, and it's going to generate steam coming up. Steam is a bad thing for us right now because steam acts like a mister wetting down the fire and we've got to generate sufficient heat that the steam coming up is minimized and that it's hot enough to quickly dry out this mound of dirt we made. That's the reason we're putting this base down here. If I made it just flat on the ground, what's going to happen? Real quickly, as soon as it starts getting going, that steam's going to come up and I'm going to put my fire out. It's going to dampen it down. It's just going to throttle it down. And no matter what you do, you can't seem to keep it going. Too much steam is coming up. See? I want to reduce the steam by making a mound and then putting my logs, fairly thick logs, close together and up off of it. Okay? So that's why we're doing this step is to minimize this steam from throttling down our fire okay now you've got your three big base logs we go to that pretty good size kindling about like that 
and we're going to put it up there. But what have I not mentioned? The bark. The bark absorbs water. And even though this stick snaps, that bark, think of it like a wet paper towel wrapped around this. It's going to dampen down. It's generating steam right there at the source. So if even I put this at the fire, first got to boil off that water in order to do it. So in my startup, when I create those three logs through there, I'm going to take my knife and get all the bark I can off of it. It ain't got to be exact. It ain't got to be polished wood. But get the bulk of it off of there. Now, most of the time, all you got to do is just take back your knife and do like that. And you see, it just comes off in sheets. This is the reason we do feather sticks instead of fuzzy sticks. That's the reason I brought it all back here before I ever started doing this. Now, I'm going to sit here at what's going to be my future fire site. And I'm going to start processing, see, this bigger stuff. Now, I've taken bulk of it off. There's still a little bit of wet there now, ain't there? But that's okay. This is also a good time for me to do this, ain't it? Start making some fuzzy sticks. When you get that one that just seems to be like this one, so easy to carve, and I can make feather sticks out of it quickly, something to catch a spark. This inner wood is dry. This outer casing is not so much, but that inner wood is dry. And by me cutting down into that, I make a pathway for the heat to get down there to the dry, to get it going and get it burning. So just go all the way around make some fuzzy sticks. The big, big base logs, take that bark off. Again, minimize the wood. All right, I have now taken my supply of pretty good sized kindling and I've stripped off all the bark of it. Now we're talking stuff that's about that big on down to like your big thumb, okay? So like wrist size and smaller is the kindling I'm going on top of them base logs. I'm gonna do like three layers of that coming up and put them like that, cross hatch pattern on top of each other, close together, leaving about a half inch between. So here on top, I'm going to put first row, and then I'm going to alternate it so this row is this way. You see this in a lot of classic pictures that were drawn of building fires out west and stuff like that. You know, Norman Rockwell, that type deal. So now I have, so now I have my mound, the water draining away from. I have my three big base logs with no bark, and now I have three tiers of alternating smaller sticks that are close together, maybe a half inch apart at most. So I get air draft through them, but at the same time, I do not have any place for the coals to go, but right up here on top. Now that I've done that, I've got my solid base. I've got them alternated on top of it. Now on top of it, I'm going to make my fire crib. I know you've never heard that. This is a term my granddaddy used for it. But what it means is I'm going to make a log cabin box on top of that platform to put my smalls and my fire into. A place to start burning. To this point, all I'm doing is minimizing my moisture content. I'm maximizing my insulation from the wet ground. Give this fire time to get going and generating a good bed of coals. And then those coals start burning through those lapsed. And then by the time they start falling down and the base logs get on fire, I should have dried out the ground around it to a couple of feet out. It's now going to hold that heat. It's not going to be putting itself out easily. Okay. So now up here on top, I'm going to put the log cabin, which is the fire crib. So I'm going to put one, two, 
three, four, and then I'm going to alternate it the other way again. But notice I put a big space between them, at least an inch. This is where I want the fire to go. And then after I jump from this layer up to this next layer up here, I'm just going to put one on the outside ends and put a crossbar across all four. So from overhead, what you'd see is one, two, three, four. Looking down through it, you're going to see this. And that's these gaps. And then below that, you're going to see these, which is this layer, see? So looking down from the top, this becomes the area right here that I'm going to build my fire in, inside this box right here that I've created. Now once I've created that crib up there, now I treat it as a regular fire. Now I have processed my big base logs, I have processed my kindling, I processed my smaller stuff, but I have not done the smalls yet. That bag of tinder, my haversack full, uh-uh, I haven't brought that even out yet. That stays closed up and in my tent. This is time consuming. I've had to hunt for those big pieces and then strip the bark off. I've had to gather up my kindling and strip the bark off. Time consuming. Okay. While I'm doing it, I'm warming the body, aren't I? Because I'm physically doing labor and that's warming me. Fire, what is it? Firewood uh, warms you when you cut it, when you, uh, when you cut it down, when you cut it to length, when you burn it, and when you shovel out the ashes, and when you prep it. Five times that thing warms you up. So that's going to keep me warm sitting there trying to strip off all this bark and everything else. That's going to generate some body heat. Okay, I've got this crib now made. Now I shift over and those smaller sticks like I just showed, I start making feather sticks or I start making fuzzy sticks and I put them in that crib. How many? Probably a dozen. I want a bird's nest of all these little giblets sticking out like that. I want to like look down in from top look like a bristle brush. I want to have to kind of work a piece in for all these little giblets, right? Because when I ignite this, I want that fire to go down there and hit those giblets and get them burning. They got plenty of air, and I want it to flow upward. Heat goes up, but I also realize that it's also drying below, and fire will mitigate downward by contact. Okay? I don't want this basin all to burn in five minutes. I want it to take an hour or so for it to burn down. So it's generating heat. It's drying the layers below. Okay. Now I take my feather sticks and I pack in there and then I bring out that real small tinder out of that haversack and I start snapping it up and I put it up there. And then out of my haversack I bring my pre-prepared tinder. Now let's talk about that for just a second. Because now we've got our fire lay set up. Let's talk about the other gorilla in the room and that's ignition ignition is always the last step so many people get this out of whack where i see them they'll generate a teeny tiny little bird's nest they'll do a little pile of sticks like this and they go whoosh, and they start firing and then and then they're running around like a fly the above bumblebee trying to find firewood uh-uh notice how i said i gathered up my little crumbly stuff and i fill that haversack as I did, I found my larger pieces and etc. and I brought it back to one central processing point. I have stacked my deck, like stacking a deck of cards. I have not talked ignition to this point. But let's talk ignition for a second. And why is it so hard to get a fire going whenever it's cold and wet and nasty? Okay? All right. Let's talk about ideal conditions, okay? If you're out west in the desert environment and it's 10% or 20% or less humidity and bone dry for the last two months, the weakest little spark can start a fire. 
let's talk flashpoint. Okay, that's the point at which something ignites and goes to burning. All right, paper, anywhere from 200 to 662 degrees Fahrenheit. Why 200? Think something super thin like toilet paper. Why 600? Think something thicker and the atmospheric conditions can be cold, wet, damp, right? And so it has to have a higher. What you're creating is you're generating a heat source. That heat source then has to warm the target and warm it up to the flash point. So you need duration. How long does this heat exist versus this? Now, thin wood, or just wood, we'll say thin, has a ignition point, a flash point of 572 to 662 degrees. So paper and thin wood are the same on the top end. But on the bottom end, there's over 372 degrees difference between that ignition point. Now let's look at your tender sources. And this, I'm gonna draw this out in a minute, but it's the pendulum of why I'm gonna to use to start this fire versus my conditions, okay? The spark from a flint and steel, somewhere on average, okay? It's going to be somewhere between five to eight hundred degrees. Well, paper's at two hundred, so you should be able to take toilet paper in a flint and steel set and pretty easy get that going, get it to catch and go. Try it; it ain't as easy as you think. Yeah, it, it, it'll work. Add a little dampness to the air. Hmm. A ferro rod produces somewhere between twenty nine hundred and six thousand degrees, depending on the composition, the makeup of the rod. How big a hunk you sheared off and that burn duration. How big, it, how big a chunk that ignited and then burned and let the temperature peak out. So the weakest is around 2,900. That big molten glob that you sheared off could be up to 6,000. Okay. When I take and I generate a spark from a ferro rod that's 2,900 and then I throw it onto that tissue paper, there is plethora of overload to instantly saturate that target and bring the temperature of the target up to the flash point and then beyond. The problem with flint and steel is it produces a five to 800 degree spark but it only has a duration of very short, so it may not have the time. I can take a 800 degree hot piece of steel and just touch your arm right quick. Will it burn it? Well, yeah, of course. But if I put an 800 degree block of steel underneath your arm for 60 seconds, would it burn you? Probably. What if I put it under there for less than a second? Probably not, because that didn't have time to saturate and reach the heat point on this. Time and duration, see. And so what ignition source is going to make a difference in this? Also, let's bring in the other thing, temperature. Paper, that plain old tissue paper, right? It ignites at 200. If the ambient temperature right now is in the summertime and it's 100 degrees, that means I only have to generate a 100 degree spark in order to get that paper to catch fire, correct? Because it's gotta be 200. So 100 degrees, ambient temperature, I'm halfway there. I only need one more little nudge to get another 100, poof. What if it's in the winter and it's zero? Now I've gotta generate double the heat I've got to generate a 200 degree. Oh, and by the way, my tissue paper is at zero degrees. I got to warm it up from zero. So this spark that's generating, you know, like 500 degrees, does it have time to warm up that thin piece of tissue? Does that spark last long enough 
to warm up that thin piece of tissue up to the flash point before it extinguishes because it's going to go 500 degrees and then it's dropping back down. See, a ferro rod, 2900, it's got a lot more come down time with that spark on there. So it has a higher chance of igniting it, correct? We're not even going to go into other primitive methods. So, my point of this is, in wet, nasty, cold conditions, or where everything is already wet, and I've had to do this because I'm sure that I'm fighting an uphill battle. Why would I try to ignite that with primitive method if I had any other choice? My number one go-to method with that, after I have got my tender in there and everything, and I brought my bone dry tender out of my fire kit to ignite, even though I can ignite it with a spark and etc. Why would I not reach in and pull out some sort of man-made, you know, ignition source that's going to produce flames? See? Not just a spark. I'm going to take this. This will catch a spark. It's saturated. It's ready to go. I'm going to tear it up and I'm going to hit it with my ferro rod or a lighter or a match. And I'm going to get this producing flame. And it's going to burn several minutes. Okay? This is going to always, always, always going to be my go-to if I have it when it's cold and wet and nasty conditions. I'm not going to mess around with a, fire rod, a ferro rod uh, if I have a lighter or matches. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to come down that order of operations of use a lighter and something like this first. If I don't have the lighter, I'll use the ferro rod to ignite it. If I don't have this, then it's going to be a ferro rod and my bone dry tender in my fire kit. If I don't have that, I'm going to down the line. It is only going to be the last resort. I would even consider trying to do a bow drill or something like that because the conditions are against me from the word go. There's so much moisture in the air, one. All the wood is wet, so even if I start from scratch and build a fireboard and a spindle and a, all that, which is very time consuming, it's probably going to take me longer to do that than it is to do the fire lay. And oh, by the way, I better, if I go and make the fire, the, the uh, um, bow drill set first, I better make sure this ain't getting wet from the moisture in the air. Because me making them feather sticks, they will absorb moisture out of there and become less effective. Clock sticking, dude. See? That's the reason I bring everything together so that what's my ignition source? It's going to be this. So that's secure. I know I got a multiple way to generate flame because I want to start it, push it over that top, and keep it going. Okay? So I'm generating flame. I carry in my fire kit a lighter, two lighters. I carry um, matches. I carry a ferro rod, I carry a block of fat lighter, I carry bone dry tender, multiple overlapping sources of ignition and tenders because if it's wet and nasty and I have to build a fire crib like this, yeah, I'm going to get this going. I'm not going to mess around with any of that. Yeah, that's a nice challenge. And I've done those as far as can you do it with a bow drill set? Yes, I did it. I'll carry a lighter in my pocket too. Because it's just your odds of failure go up. You're, you're really fighting. And that's one of the reasons I don't do bow drill sets down here myself. I live in a place that's unusually high humidity. And so you'll do a righteous bow drill set and you'll get down there and you'll be pumping like crazy and you'll generate a coal and you watch that coal just because the humidity is so high and the wood was a touch damp and failure rate's too high. Is the object of this game to get a fire going or to challenge our fire building skills? Either way works, but let's stay focused, okay? So, I have now got my fire crib full in here of feather sticks and fuzzy sticks. 
into the middle of that, I will put my tender, and then I'm gonna put underneath it my burning puck, burning piece of fat wood, whatever, my match, whatever, to set this fire. I want this whole top up here to become the birth of my fire, right there. It's far enough off the ground that I am not going to have steam issues. As this burns and this heat radiates down, it's going to dry even more this fuel. It's sort of a variation of an upside down fire. As these coals start trickling down into this, this is going to set these on fire. Then this is going. This will get this packed with coals and this will get going and now I've got this much coals to rain down in here. So as that little bit of steam that's left is this heat has had time to dry out. This ground has had time to drain the water out. Now I've got this whole column is now one big fire. And a cold, wet winter fire is a big fire. I'm trying to generate a, a heat source that will overwhelm whatever I put in it. Once I get that fire, and I want that fire to be this big, you know, I don't want a little bitty fire. I want a fire. You know, that's when I'm going to start feeding it more and more. Now I don't have to process so much. Once I got a big bed of coals, I'm still going to want to take the bark off those big pieces because it's going to do nothing but generate steam. But just wipe the bulk of it off and throw it whole into the fire. Get it going. Once I've got a nice big bed of coals, it can self-feed then. Now that's when I want to talk about possibly putting in a self-feed system of putting poles to the side on either side and have logs roll down like you've seen in videos once I get my big old bed of coals going. See, the things that are against you, temperature, I have to generate an even hotter spark and warm up the temperature of the fuel to get to the ignition source. Two, the moisture content of the air and the wood and everything else. I want to focus, if at all possible, I want to focus on lighters, matches, and some sort of man-made tinder that's gonna give me several minutes of flame. You know how I love fatwood. Fatwood comes heavily into this at that point because I'm gonna shave it off in long slivers and stand it up inside here, vertically up in there. Give it something to ignite and act like a torch burning in there. Are you cheating? You dang right. If you're not trying, you ain't cheating. Every advantage I can get, that's what I want. Every unfair advantage to get this fire going because it's necessary, it's important, it's cold, I need to warm up my core temperature, I need to cook my food, I need to boil my water, whatever. This is necessary, so use every advantage but also know what the odds against you are. Remember old Han Solo, never tell me the odds, bull. I want to know what's against me. I know that ground is sodden wet, and if I build on it or give it an opportunity, it's gonna put my fire out. So I've got to fight that. Pull me up a mound, get out up so that water drains away from that, then build on top of that mound build my fire to build me a big bed of coals. Now once I get my fire going, then I want to dry wood with it. Let me draw that out for you right quick. Okay, overhead view. Right here is the fire, okay? Out here a short distance away, I'm gonna be sitting, let's say here, I'm gonna put long pieces of firewood all the way around and then I'm going to put on top of that another one 
like an old-fashioned Amish type fence all the way around that fire. So the heat of the fire is drying out this wood before I add it to the fire. That way, my next wave of wood that I've sat there and stripped the bark off of, and I stick it out there and I'm letting that fire dry it out. Those up on stacked up on top are higher in the heat column. They're gonna dry quicker, right? I'll rotate them, rotis them. After they've been out there 10 minutes or so and this side's dry, rotate it, put the wet backside up there. I'm drying out my firewood. I'm adding more BTUs to my coming fire, right? Now, as I take the, that top row of that fence and I add it to the fire, that bottom row, I may stack and uh, flip them over and stack another new round on top. And then when I add that top row in, this time I'll roll that now dry one out of the way, stack it up, and I'll put fresh wet on the bottom and that row becomes the top. So I'm rotating the entire fire set up to dry to go in. And now I have dry firewood. Now I'm making a bigger bed of coals, see? Also making it harder for a rainstorm or something to put the fire out. So if rain starts coming in, I can stack firewood over the top of it and let the fire keep burning. Let the wood act almost like a roof. Yeah, it's gonna burn, that's good. As long as it diverts the water away from the actual fire so that my fire doesn't get put out by the rain. See, again, where did I build it? Up under that tree with those broad leaves. Remember I hunted drier ground? That means I've got a little bit. Now make sure above you, remember Widowmakers, there is nothing within like 10 or 12 feet up. I don't want this fire to set the tree on fire. Even though the tree's sopping wet, it can dry those leaves out over an evening and have a tree catch on fire. We don't want that, that's a forest problem. So I want to stay focused here. So let's recap. One, you have determined, okay, I'm gonna be stopping. I use the five W's. I look for a wood source. I look for a water source. I look for weather. Which way is the rain coming from? There's gonna be a lot of wind, little wind, etc. Anything to do with that. I look for puddles, saturated ground. I don't want that to camp on. I want the driest place I can find to set up my camp and to build my fire. Then, of course, there's wild, uh, wildlife. Make sure I ain't in the middle of a cow trail or whatever. It's going to cause me other problems, okay? Widowmakers, make sure this tree ain't got a big broke limb or a broke top in it or it's a dead tree that might catch fire. So there's my five W's. I then am going to put up my camp and I'm going to start out, I'm going to empty out my haversack or some other dry bag, and I'm going to start looking for other dry places up under to find wood that snaps, doesn't just bend. Smalls is what I'm looking for first, and I want to fill that haversack to the top, as tight as I can pack it in there. I want abundance, okay? As I do, and I come across maybe a standing or something up off the ground, pretty good sized log like that, something that I can cut, snap, break, or whatever, and make into my base log sizes. I'm gonna bring that back to camp. Then I'm gonna gather up all my other kindling and fuel, bring it back to camp. And then I'm gonna sit there in camp, and I'm gonna start with that big base log, and I'm going to determine, okay, here's where I want my fire. I'm gonna rake me up dirt and make me a mound. The higher, the better. If I got plenty and easy to do, make it six, eight inches high. Two inches is fine, but six to eight is even better. Now, how big do I want it? I want it the size of a car tire, at least. You know, something like that big around. Okay, now I go to my base logs. I strip all that excess bark off of it, and I set them up there and kind of seat them in good so they're not going to want to roll. Leaving, how big? About an inch or so gap between them, okay? That way when they do ignite, they'll burn to each other through the heat, okay? It's about an inch. So we got airflow up and it'll catch coals between. Then on top of that, now I start my lattice work of my larger kindling. Da da da, da da da, da da da, da da. About two or three layers up. And then I make that hollow box, that log cabin, the fire crib on top. 
once I've got that, everything's been shaved off bark and put together. Now I go to my smalls. Now I go over here and I make me a bunch of feather sticks or fuzzy sticks to stick in there. On top of that, I will take and put my smalls, snapping them up, putting them in there. Usually they're so small, they do snap, but the bark is so hard to get off of them because they're so small. See, I'll make a point of trying to wipe them and get what I can. All right, that's what those fuzzy sticks are for. Then out comes my tinder from my fire kit. A man-made tinder that's gonna burn for several minutes. That big hunk of fat wood I carry. Make shavings out of it, use it. Use one of these pucks like I've showed, you know. The puck type, be good time to do it. Bring out that lighter or that uh, lifeboat match, strike it, ignite it, and put it in there and get the fire going in the top. Now sit there while it's going and feed it the smalls out of my haversack a small amount at a time. I want to get this fire going and get those feather sticks and fuzzy sticks ignited so the crown of that fire crib is burning. As that goes, I just keep adding sticks. Now it burns down and now my tender, my first kindling starts igniting as the hot coals drop down between it and get them going. They got air coming in from the outside, they got air coming up from below, and they go to burning. Then it goes down into that bigger, you know, fuel. And then finally, it gets down to my base logs. By then, I can just sit back. Now I can add around it. Once I get it going good, what do I do? I start stacking up my firewood that I've gathered around it in a, in a fence type, like an old Amish split fence so that I'm drying my firewood out. So my heat is not only drying me, warming me, I'm probably gonna rig me up a, 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 a tripod or something, start cooking dinner, whatever it is I need to do, but I'm also drying out. And I keep rotating it in. That is the in depth, beyond what you've seen in the video of them. You know, I made a fire in the rain. How do I keep the fire going? I wanna only build it once. I want to do all this effort because it's going to be a lot of effort once. And then once it's going, I want plenty of firewood to keep adding in. Now when it's time to go to bed, that's when I want to bank the fire. And what that means in English is I want to keep this fire going all night if I can. So remember them base logs? Once it gets down to where they're gone and it's just a big old pile of coal, I want to rake some of this now dry dirt on this mound up onto the sides and kind of almost bury the fire toward the middle. And then up here in the middle, I'm gonna put me a couple of big hunks side by side up there with just a little bitty gap between them, close. I'm gonna go to bed. And what's gonna happen is, as the night goes, I've starved it for oxygen. It's not gonna go out, but it's gonna slowly burn because it can't get enough oxygen. It's gasping for breath. And so it keeps going and it becomes these coals. And so that two big hunks I put on top will slowly be consumed. Well, six to eight hours whenever I get up in the morning and I pull my fresh tinder out and I've got my other kindling ready to go right here. They've already made fuzzy sticks and kept them in my haversack or whatever. In the morning, I'm gonna roll those big coals out and you're gonna have big coals. Take my hat and fan it and you'll see the ash come off and there'll be these big coals. That's what I put my dry tinder on, my shavings of fat wood on, my little bitty sticks on top of, and add a little bit of air. And it starts back up again. Now, remember that dry firewood I have? I start forming a shape around it, build on top, and I build it like the, now it's like the fire cribs on the bottom. I build a little square around it, and I put good stuff on top, and let that flames coming up start cooking it, and my fire's going again. I can keep a single lit fire going for a week if I just keep constantly working. At night, I bank the fire, and during the day, I fuel the fire. Hope you've enjoyed this content, guys. Please hit that like, share, and subscribe if you have. Till next time, guys, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.